right, everyone. We are going to begin. And just so we have a recap of where we're at, we're taking a break from our series in Matthew 10, which talks about what Christians can expect from the world as they go out into the world. Uh, we can expect a rough time because the world stands opposed to the gospel message. And so we are taking a break from Matthew 10 and looking at a few psalms, Psalm 4, 5, 6, and 7, which deal with various trials that the believers in Christ will face. So today we're talking Psalm 6, when the Christian has sorrow. So let's read through Psalm 6, and we'll pray, and we'll get into the text. Psalm 6. To the choir master with stringed instruments, according to the Shemeneth, a psalm of David. O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you, and Joel, who will give you praise. I am weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. Let's pray once more as we begin. Heavenly Father, we, we ask that as we come to your word, uh, a specific passage of scripture that deals with sorrow, and David's problem here with sadness, we pray that you would make this text very practical to us, that we may learn how to behave as a Christian when we are full of sorrow, when we have grief, when we sin against you. Lord, we desire not to sin, but we do sin because we are not perfect. And when we are remorseful over our sin, when we're desperate even, or we feel like we're in a moment of desperation, we pray that this psalm would come to mind for us, and that your word would instruct us in our hearts. We pray that this, would, this, this word would be impactful to our lives, that we would remember it, that we can turn to it when we're facing uh, this kind of situation pray that you would be with us and, and bless us, our study of your word. May the Holy Spirit guide our hearts and be drawn closer to you. Create in us a greater dependency upon you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I know I've said this the last two weeks, but I'm going to say it again because I want you to remember the whole book, the Bible, the whole book, it's about Jesus. The whole book of Psalms, it's about Jesus, and this particular psalm is about Jesus. This psalm doesn't directly mention Jesus, but it points us to Jesus. And so Psalm 4, we looked at that, and we saw how in Psalm 4, David's faith was mocked. But he took comfort in the fact, as verse 3 says, that the Lord set apart the godly for himself. We can have peace, even if our faith is mocked, that we are the Lord's. In Psalm 5, we looked at how the Christian must face the world, and how David had to face the, the world. We saw that no matter what, we can turn to God for peace. 
because the Lord has drawn us out of the world. We take joy in knowing that we have refuge in him, as verse 11 says. So Psalm 4 is when your faith is mocked, when the Christian's faith is mocked, or when Christianity is mocked. Psalm 5 talks about when the Christian must face the world, and Psalm 6 here, we're presented, when the, uh, we're presented with the scenario of when the Christian has sorrow. So the text before the psalm is an interesting one. It says, to the choir master, just like Psalm 4 and Psalm 5, uh, it is directed to be played with stringed instruments, as Psalm 4 is as well. And it's, it, it, it says here, according to the shim, shiminet, shiminet, I believe is the pronunciation. So we really don't know what that means, the shiminet. Now the King James Version, excuse me, the New King James Version, says it's to be played on an eight-string harp. Some scholars say that Sheminet has something to do with the number eight. So some people will say it's to be played on an eight-string harp. Uh, the translators of the New King James Version felt so strongly that they put it in there in the text. Other people think that it may have something to do with an octave, which is um, eight notes, that it perhaps is to be played in a lower octave because it is a somber psalm. But uh, I heard one preacher say that for as many commenters that there are, you'll find as many interpretations of it um, in regards to what the Shemeneth could be. So we really don't know. Uh, one of the few things that we can take away from the, the text here above the psalm is that it is a psalm of David, just like uh, 4 and 5 that we've looked at. So first, we'll look at what David's problem is. Let's take a look at verse 1. It says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. So what's David thinking about here? Well, it seems, I think, apparent that David has done something wrong. David has sinned. Other Expositors may have commented that David didn't necessarily sin, but he has sorrow. But it seems apparent, to me at least, from verse 1, that David has sinned. Otherwise, why would he be rebuked? Why would God be angry? Why would he need to be disciplined in wrath? So it seems as if David here has sinned. We don't know what the occasion was. Sometimes we do know what the occasion was in the Psalms. If you remember, Psalm 51 was connected to the episode with Bathsheba, but we don't know what Psalm 6 specifically is about that David writes. Um, we don't know specifically which sin in David's life that he writes about. But it does seem apparent, doesn't it, that David has done something wrong. And he asked God, not to discipline him in his wrath. Now this wrath here, this anger, is not the wrath that is poured out upon the wicked who do not believe in Christ at the end of the age. It's not God's unfettered wrath. It is not hell, so to speak. Uh, in this scenario, God's wrath would be his firm disciplinary hand. So you imagine perhaps a son or a, a daughter who has done something wrong. And they say, Daddy, please do not, please do not punish me harshly. They recognize that they've done something wrong, but they ask not to be punished strongly. So David here, he already knows that he's sinned. He says, Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. He starts out with a plea for mercy. But he's already come to the conclusion, hasn't he, that he is, has done something wrong. And again, we don't know what it is. It could be the episode with the Sheba. It could be the fact that he took a census when he wasn't supposed to, if you remember that in First Chronicles 21. We don't know what it is, but we do know that he has done something wrong. So David is experiencing sorrow over sin, 
perhaps even anxiety over sin. He's worried that the Lord will harshly rebuke him for whatever it is that he's done. So that's one of his problems. Secondly, verse 2 says, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. And we do know sometimes that stress can manifest itself in physical pain. Or perhaps David had an unrelated issue of some kind of physical problem. Whether it was a result from his sin and his anxiety over his sin and a troubled conscience, or if it was a completely separate issue, we don't really know. But what we do know is not only did David have sorrow over his sin, but he also had physical affliction. That's problem number two. What else? Well, he says, my soul also is greatly troubled. Many people realize that they do sin, but not a lot of people are greatly troubled over their sin, are they? So he has sorrow over his sin. He has some kind of physical stress. He's, his soul is troubled. Now let's look at verse 6. Let's skip down to verse 6. He says, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with weeping. The beginning of verse 7 says, My eye wastes away because of grief. David would essentially cry himself to sleep at night. It seems like every night. He is so filled with sorrow that he's weary. He is, he's weak because of this issue. He's weary with his moaning. He says, Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. He says, my eye wastes away because of grief. He's crying his eyes out, would be the modern way of saying that, perhaps. But David is suffering from intense, intense misery. Now you're going to say, the last few psalms that we've read, Richard, David has seemed really sad. Maybe David is just kind of a sad person. Maybe David is a melancholy person who is always real sad. He's not a real tough guy. That's not true. That's not true. If we, it's one thing we know about David. It's that the guy was a, a, a tough person, at least physically. He wouldn't cry in the face of danger. If you remember the story of David and Goliath, Saul was trying to figure out what uh, what they were going to do with Goliath. And in 1 Samuel 17, let me just read you these few verses. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. That's Goliath. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. Saul says, David, you're not going to go out and fight this guy. He's huge. You're young. This man is an ex experienced person in the military. But what does David say to Saul? He says, and David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep, that's David, he used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. David says, if there was a lion that snatched away a sheep, I would go chase down that lion, snatch the, the sheep out of the mouth of the lion, and if he came against me, I'd grab the lion by the beard on his face and I would strike him and kill him. David's not a pushover. David is a tough, tough guy. I think that's a pretty uh, strong case that he makes. Because he says in verse 37, And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. But what did Saul say to David? He said, Go, and the Lord be with you. So if you're willing to fight down a lion, if you're willing to fight a bear, maybe you could fight this guy. He made a convincing case. David will say, 
was not a whim. But David still had enough of a relationship with God to recognize when he sinned and have remorse over his sin. So this is an experience that is not outside the realm of possibility for the believer. So if you are having grief over your sin, or if you are facing a particularly difficult issue, physical affliction, spiritual affliction, if you, like David, drench your couch at night or your bed at night with tears, this is the psalm for you. Uh, not only are there all of these issues that David faces, but also he's persecuted as well, isn't he? Of course he is. The second part of verse 7 says, It grows weak because of all my foes. Perhaps they are ridiculing him for the predicament he finds himself in now because of his sin. But we do know certainly that David faced a lot of opposition, didn't he? We can just go back through the last few psalms again, and we can see it. In Psalm 3, his son is trying to kill him. That's what the title in Psalm 3 says. It's when he's fleeing from Absalom. His son is trying to take the throne from him. In Psalm 4, his faith is mocked. The king, his faith, is mocked. Just because he's royalty doesn't mean that he's exempt from persecution. Psalm 5. Well, we read about those people that he has to face, don't we? He says in verse 9 of Psalm 5, For there is no truth in their mouth, their inmost self is destruction, their throat is an open grave, and they flatter with their tongue. These are the people that David has to face. And next week we'll see, Lord willing, in Psalm 7, that they falsely accuse David of doing things that he didn't even do. So certainly all these kinds of things, the believer probably will face at some point. Persecution, misery, spiritual affliction, physical affliction, and sorrow over sin. It is a sad state of affairs that uh, many people who claim themselves to be evangelicals are in. They say that if you believe in Jesus, everything will be happy, happy, happy. Well, that's not the case. As we continue on after we finish these psalms, as we continue on in Matthew 10, we'll reiterate that point. Jesus says that we can expect trouble from this world because the world has rejected Christ. How much more so are they going to reject his followers? So David is faced with the same kind of problems, I think, that we read about in Matthew 10. And of course, these kinds of problems may result in sorrow in someone's life. No one's going to be happy about these things. But, but, what can we do to find peace when faced with these kinds of issues? Well, what did David do? David prayed. Look at his prayer in verse 4, the beginning of verse 4. It says, Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. He asks the Lord to save him, doesn't he? He doesn't turn to his military might to wipe out these people that are perhaps mocking him. He didn't do that, as we read in, in Psalm 4 and 5. He prayed. And that's David's response to all these different kinds of trials in these few Psalms. 3, 4, 5, 6. He prays. He prays. He asks God to Forgive him, not to discipline him harshly. He says, deliver my life, Lord. Take my life out of these circumstances. And he also, when he prays, he uses a kind of argument. Not that he's arguing with God, but he gives God a reason to save him. First he says, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. And this method I think of prayer is very important. We see this a lot from David. He presents a reason as to why it would be beneficial for God to do what he's asking for. I think it's very important for us to do that when we pray. It'll keep us first from doing things, or praying for things rather, that are selfish. Lord, I pray for a bunch of money. Why? Uh, I like money. See, that doesn't work. If we pray 
like David did here, save me for the sake of your steadfast love. David is saying, perhaps others will see your steadfast love in the fact that you've forgiven me and you've brought me out of this predicament, that you may have the glory. And so it's good, I think, to present a reason to urge, to plead with God when in prayer. Secondly, in verse 5, he says this, For in death there is no remembrance of you in Shoal who will give you praise. This is an interesting verse. At first glance, you might, you might say, Wait, are we not going to be praising God when we die and are in heaven? That's not what David's saying here. What David is saying is, If I'm dead, I can't be on earth praising you. I can't be on earth telling other people about who you are. So David is pleading for his life. He feels like he's about to die. He's so filled with sorrow. He's persecuted from his enemies. And so he says, Lord, please keep me alive so I can bring you glory by continuing to live. I'll bring you praise. I'll tell other people about you. I'll, I'll continue telling them. I'll make sure that there is remembrance of you because I will be telling people about you. Getting praise. David presents two arguments, I think, that are really good. And now, in verse 8, if we look at verse 8, we can see the power of prayer. If you read the first seven verses of this psalm, you'll say, okay, David... David's really going through a rough time. David is sad. David, I'll be praying for David. <laughs> that's, what, that's what you would say if you were reading it and you were alive in David's time. But if you read verses 8 to 10, it almost seems as if someone else has picking up, uh, picked up the pen and started writing for David. He seems different. The tone has changed. Why has the tone changed? Because David prayed. This is a picture of the before and the after. So let's just look at this. He says, Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. Different tense there. He's not asking God to hear him. He said, The Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled and shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. And he says these people that are causing me grief, they're going to be shamed because they're standing against the one that God has forgiven. What a change in David in these three verses. What a change. Look at his peace. Again, it seems like someone else has written these three verses. It's because prayer gives us confidence in the Lord. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray without ceasing. Prayer should, be, prayer should become a kind of a culture in our lives. Prayer should be something that we turn to immediately when we have issues. And we should be constantly praying. Not that, not that we uh, don't go to work because we're too busy praying, but we pray on our way to work. We pray under our breath while we're at work. We pray before we go to work. Like David, I, I like to think that in Psalm 5, David prays before he goes out and faces the world. We should be doing that. We should be praying that God helps us deal with the people that we have to face in the world that stand opposed to him. Prayer should be a constant thing for us. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5.17 again says, Pray without ceasing. You have at your disposal such a wonderful tool. It sits in your tool belt. How often will you use it? So what's the application? And I want to make this practical. I want us to be able to see this um, very clearly. Because we can read the psalm and say, Okay, David had some issues. David was sad. David was facing difficulties. He prayed, and God gave him confidence. Is that it? Is that all we see in the psalm? No, I don't think so. 
I think there's an overarching picture if we step back and look at the song. First, let me just say this, that this kind of pattern is just one piece in the Christian life. Having problems, whether it's related to your own sin, whether it's a physical issue, whether your soul is troubled, whether someone's persecuting you, whether you feel depressed, whatever it is, praying and then having the courage to move on, that's just one piece in the Christian life. But we see in Jesus, our Lord, he faced very similar troubles that David did. You see, in David and his problems, we can look through David and see the Lord Jesus. We can also see in David a follower of God. So let's look at this. I want to read to you a few verses and then we're going to turn to uh, Luke eventually. But we can expect a soul that is uh, troubled because of what the world does, for example. Hebrews 5, 7 says this, In the day of his, days of his flesh, that is when Jesus was on earth, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Was David heard? Yes, he was. David was confident of that. He said, the Lord accepts my prayers. The Lord has heard my plea. Jesus prayed. Did he pray emotionally? Yes, he did. Hebrews 5, 7 says, he prayed with loud cries and tears. So David is really just following in his master's footsteps, even though Christ had not come to earth yet. So when we pray, we can present our problems to the Lord. And we can cry. And we can tell him all our issues. And the Lord will hear us. We can be confident of that. So what did Jesus pray about? Or rather, I guess the better question would be, what kind of troubles did Jesus have? Well, Jesus did have sorrow over sin. It wasn't his sin, but it was the sin of the world that he saw. So in one sense, he did have sorrow over sin. Again, he was sinless. He is sinless. But he did cry over the sin. Or I should say, he had sorrow over sin. Luke 19, 41 and 42 says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, we're speaking of Jerusalem, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Jesus looks over Jerusalem and says, You would think that you would know how to have peace with God, but even Jerusalem, the city of David, does not. They're hidden from you because you do not understand. And the fact that the Jewish people in his day did not understand the truth of God caused him to weep. Christ felt sorrow over the sins of people. You might say even, in our case, our own sins. Christ also faced intense misery. We sang about that. Isaiah 53, 3 calls him a man of sorrows. And of course he was acquainted with grief. He was murdered by the religious establishment. The very establishment that was supposed to be the representation of God's people. The, the religious leaders of God's people. They murdered the Son of God. Of course he was subject to misery. But you see, Christ was called a man of sorrows. So I do want to tell you, it is okay to be sad. It is not a sin to be sad. It is part of the, the human experience. It's part, even more so, of the, the Christian experience. Because we see what evil awaits in the world, awaits us in the world. 
Of course, we're not going to be happy about it. Christ was subject to misery on this earth. And he was also subject to persecution. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke 22. We're going to look at two sets of verses in Luke 22. So in Luke 22, this is what the religious establishment did to him in verses 63 to 65 after his trial. These are the very people that are supposed to govern the people of God, the Jews. People who were supposed to know the truth about God. These were their leaders. They allowed this to happen. Verses 63 to 65 of Luke 22. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophecy, who is it that struck you? They said many other things against him, blaspheming him. These were the leaders, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, he was acquainted with grief and sorrow. I can barely read those verses without being disgusted. I'm tearing up right now just thinking about it. What a terrible, terrible thing to do. So yeah, Jesus faced troubles, and we can expect to face troubles like Jesus. Again, we're familiar with that in Matthew 10. He says, if they maligned me, they're going to malign you. They're going to stand opposed to you. But, because we're going to face the same troubles, the same kind of troubles that Jesus faced, we can expect that, we should also pray like Jesus did. Just look back a little bit in Luke 22, verses 39 to 46. Luke 22. We're going to start in verse 39. And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. Pause. I just want you to note that this was his custom. He would go to the Mount of Olives and pray. Do we have a custom of prayer? Do we have a place where we pray? Do we make it a regular thing in our lives? 40. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, just a little distance away, and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What a wonderful prayer. He asked the Lord to take away his affliction. But he says, Lord, if it's your will, so be it. And what was Christ facing? The worst punishment that we could ever imagine. The unfettered wrath of God placed upon him for our sin. But even facing that, that unimaginable punishment, what does Christ say? Not my will, but yours, Lord. Now, verses 30, excuse me, verses 43 and 44, scholars say that those verses, and even in my Bible here, it says some manuscripts omit verses 43 and 44, but it says, And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now, whether or not he, as some believe, was so, we'll say, anxious about what was about to occur, that he um, actually sweat blood, or if the drops of sweat coming down his head were like drops of blood. It doesn't really matter. Um, and even if these verses weren't in the original manuscript, even if they're not there, we do know and we can imagine the great burden placed upon Jesus in this time because he knew what he was going to face. And not only was Christ facing persecution from God in the sense that he was going to suffer wrath from God on our behalf on the cross, but all the mocking and everything leading up to it, the crown of thorns, the nails, carrying his cross, all these things, the jeering, the mocking, the scoffing, all these things he knew he would face. 
And I love this in verses 45 and 46. And he arose from prayer, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So even facing, even facing this great kind of affliction, he encourages his disciples who honestly are probably oblivious to the situation to pray. Even while facing great affliction, he encourages others to pray. We need to pray like this. We need to ask the Father what it is that we desire, but realize that it's going to be his will. It's going to be done. Christ made a custom of praying, it seems like, on the Mount of Olives. It needs to be our custom or our habit to pray when facing affliction. And we need to encourage others to pray. We need to pray like Jesus. Will you pray when others won't? Will you pray like Jesus and not fall asleep like the disciples? If you want to have peace like David had peace, you'll pray. You see, God doesn't need our prayers, but when we pray to God, it aligns our will with his. We say, Lord, I'm facing this problem, whatever it is, but I will trust in you, and I will place my hope in you, And you see now that we're at God's disposal. Now our heart is aligned with his will and we're ready to do whatever God has for us to do. Prayer realigns or retunes our heart. This is why it's so important. This is why David has peace. He prays and we see the effects. David has peace. He can face his enemies. Christ prays and he can face the cross. We need to offer prayers like Jesus did. And we need to live like Jesus did. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2, let's look at verses, we'll start in verse 18. It says servants, and I just want to note here that uh, the servant here uh, in the Greek denotes kind of a household servant. It's not really a slave, but a a worker in the home. Really, really just a worker, um, a house servant. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. This is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if you do good and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. David was suffering, and he did sin. And so Peter here makes the case that if you sin and you suffer, that's one thing. But if you have done nothing wrong and suffer. If you conduct yourself in a godly manner, that's very, very good. So whether we sin and we're deserving of punishment or not, whether whatever kind of problem we find ourselves in, Peter writes here, how good of a thing or how gracious of a thing it is in the sight of God when we do good and suffer and endure. And what's the point that Peter's making here what he says in verse 21 where to this you have been called so we have been called to that because this is the reason Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps he committed no sin neither was this deceit found in his mouth it sounds a lot like Isaiah 53 when he was reviled he did not revile in return When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You see, when Christ suffered unjustly, when Christ faced the cross, did he revile? No. He prayed for his enemies. 
So when we face troubles, we need to pray like Jesus, but we need to conduct our, ourselves as well like Jesus in our problems, in our troubles. We need to act godly whether or not we deserve to be punished. And this is where we get to the gospel message. Christ lived a perfect life. Verse 21 says that he is our example. He is our example. As Christians, he's the one that we're to follow. We can talk about being like David, but really David was being like his master. David had a problem. He prayed. He had issues. We're following in Christ's footsteps. Because Christ, verse 24 says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Christ willingly suffered punishment. Suffered punishment that he did not deserve and he endured it. So we, in this life, we are to uh, expect problems. We are to expect to have sorrow. Whatever kind of sorrow it is. But we need to remember Christ's suffering for our behalf. It says, for you were straying like sheep and now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We have, we all like sheep have gone astray, everyone to their own way. We were lost in our sins, but Christ has died for us and now we believe in him. We're going to follow in his footsteps. And that's the gospel message, isn't it? That's the, the Christian life. If we believe in Christ, uh, we have peace in him and we know that he has borne our sins. He has taken on the wrath of God for us. And so we can go out into the world and proclaim who he is. And so for the, for the unbeliever, you read a passage like Psalm 6 and you think, well, how, how do they even know any of these kind of problems that David's facing? The unbeliever has no sorrow over their sin. They don't even know that they're sinning. They don't even subscribe to uh, God's law. And so what the sinner needs to do, what the unbeliever needs to do, is turn to Christ. Turn to the one who has suffered on the cross in faith so that they may have peace. The same kind of peace that David writes about so often in the Psalms. And for us, who believe in Christ, who now expect persecution because we are identified with him, when we face these kinds of trials, we must remember Christ and how he conducted himself. Let us remember that Christ is our example. That's what verse 21 says. It's a very important verse. For this you have been called... That is suffering, perhaps unjustly. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. Let's let Christ be our example, and let's follow in his footsteps. And we can have peace knowing that we are his, no matter what, no matter what happens. We can have peace with God. And I'm just going back to Psalm 4, 3 here. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. So Christian, when you sin, when you are faced with difficulty, whatever it is, have comfort and peace in knowing that the Lord has taken you out of the world. He has set you apart from the world and called you to himself. And he will hear you when you call on him. As we close today, I'll, I'll pray and then we'll stand and we'll sing It Is Well, number 580 in our hymnal. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we, we thank you so much that we have your word, that we can turn to it in times of difficulty. We thank you for the book of Psalms that shows us so many different scenarios that might happen in our life, different kinds of trials perhaps that we might face. We see the whole range of uh, human emotion on display. Praise, sorrow, uh, 
And we, we see in Psalm 6 a picture of what we are to do when we face difficulty, when we face sorrow. Lord, we pray that this psalm would come to our minds, that uh, this pattern of prayer would be a reality in our life, that we would turn to you when we are in despair, that we would seek you out when we have sorrow, and not turn to anything else or anyone else, but we would turn to you first, that you would be our anchor, that you would be our refuge, that we would be totally dependent upon you. If the world forsakes us, Lord, let us turn to you as we go about our business this week in the world. We pray that you would help us to remember Psalm 6. When we are weary with crying, when we are tired from misery, we pray that we would turn to you in prayer. We pray these things in Jesus' name.